So again, my name is Mark Chang. I'm a managing director at Duff and Phelps. Duff and Phelps is a truly global. We, we've got presence in multiple cities in China. Uh, we've got two offices here in the Bay Area and many offices across the US. We are a valuation and corporate finance firm. Re with a recent acquisition, we have now gotten into uh, forensic and uh, IT security as well. I've been um, in the Bay Area for over 12 years. I primarily work on mergers and acquisitions of technology companies. All right, and I'm going to pass it off to Holly. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Holly, Holly Zen. Uh, I work for a company actually called uh, Blue Focus. If most of you speak Chinese, the name is Lanse Guangbiao. Uh, so we're a public company listed in China about uh, last year, probably about um, 15 billion US, uh, 15 billion uh, Ch Chinese RMB mar market rep as well as the revenue. So we're the biggest uh, communication group in China and uh, when we're talking about communication basically we're offering services anywhere from PR, media services, creative uh, technologies, uh, big data de design. And my role actually in the company is uh, the CEO for the international business. So talking about international business, uh, we actually acquired about seven agencies in the last uh, four years. There are about 2,000 people under me. Uh, again, all offering similar communication services. Uh, in this world, actually, more and more services are actually going around the product and the creative coming to together. So with that perspective, I think we can offer lots of services to the people coming from big brand names as well as startup companies. Thank you. 大家好,我是来自这个海英基金,唐壮龙。我们这个海英基金是国内的中国的老鹰基金我们很关注在这里的特别是华人创业的项目希望能这些项目以后能够到中国国内去进行一些跨境的加速这是我们的主要的任务嗨大家好我叫田文琪 Jessica Tian I've been practicing international tax since 1995 in the Silicon Valley in San Francisco area during 2007 through 2014 I went to China specifically Beijing and then Shanghai uh, to start a tax practice for one of the big four accounting firms now I belong to the law firm DLA Piper uh, very recently you know you all know US tax had gone through a big reform so these days, my full-time job is trying to reshape the IP ownership structures for quite a few of the Silicon Valley companies. Hi, I'm Eric Lassala. I'm the managing partner of Peakview Capital. Uh, Peakview Capital is a fund of funds based here in Silicon Valley. Uh, we invest Chinese capital into U.S. VCs, leading U.S. VCs. We tend to target those sort of 30 or 40 firms that uh, that have been around for a while and tend to sort of have more control over the market. Um, and our first fund was about 200 million. Uh, we've just announced a new partnership with Zhong Sun uh, to invest a, a new fund. Uh, we're also uh, VC direct investors. I've been doing venture capital for about 20 years myself, uh, both here in Silicon Valley and also for several years in China. Okay, thank you. So we'll start with our first question for Holly. Um, Holly, what should startups be aware of when it comes to their marketing and PR efforts? Uh, interesting question. I think actually this question applies to startups as well as all the CMOs that uh, at the big companies. Uh, what we noticed in the past several years actually, CM roles, role is changing basically. Uh, some company, even like a Coke, Coca-Cola, one of the biggest brands in, in the world, they're removing the C, CMO role per se and moving it towards the more like a CG or CR or what is that? That's the chief growth officer and chief revenue officer. The reason I mentioned about that, I think especially for the startup company, uh, 
as the head for marketing or PR or communication, your role and the primary responsibility should pretty much align with your CEO. So what is that about? It's about revenue growth. In today's world, uh, it's not about just making a story anymore. It's not only about making the headline. It's about the performance. It's how you're going to combine the performance with your brand name and your storytelling. That's the reason more and more towards for a marketing agency, a coding company like us, we focus more on the data and the measuring the ROI. So if I can uh, maybe make one suggestion to the uh, startup marketing head or, or even the CEO itself, I think the, the line's pretty aligned basically. Uh, think about a way, a strategic way and the impactful way to talk to your audience through different channels and uh, in a meaningful, in an impact way. I think that's one advice I can give. Mark, can I just ask a question? Because I'm yeah. very curious. Uh, last week, I met with the CEO of a, of a company about $50 million in sales, and I was surprised to learn that they have they've hired four different PR firms. And one was for uh, the tech press, and one was for uh, consumer uh, press, another was for networking, um, another was for sort of general, um, general uh, publicity. And that's, I mean, I'd never heard of that before. So to, to your point, is it becoming more, is PR becoming more specialized? Um, well, it becomes more generic and as well as become more specific. The reason actually there's a higher different discipline is that when we do PR communication, when you do a 2B business or when you do a 2C business, it's very different. The channels are different, the message is different, and the audience are very different. That's the reason sometimes if they want to uh, really deliver the message in a specific way, they want to have the expertise in different field. Uh, but I mean, for $50 million company, I have to say I've, I'm very impressed. They put so much emphasis on marketing. Most of the brands we deal with, uh, any brands that you guys can, can be aware of, we deal with the top 2,000 brands in the world. Anybody you can think of from you know, P&G, from you know, to VW, Audi, Mercedes, they do hire different agencies to deal with different things because the expertise are different. And also, there's a concept right now we call it, you know, most people familiar with 2B and 2C. Actually, there is a word called D2C, direct to consumer. So there are steps in between that you need to do marketing, deliver message through different scenario and different channel. That's the reason you know, they want to hire the best expert in the field, I guess. That's very helpful. All right, um, Chen Long, what are particularly hot areas of uh, investment interest? Uh uh 这个可能侧重点是会不一样要申请这个FDA 市场上的一些资源大的企业的一些销售渠道这是我们给他能够提供的
来提供一些研呃制药的研发啊，我们投了一个项目，就是用人工智能来帮助这个制药的研发啊，这方面我们也做做了一些一些这样的工作啊，包括在区块链方面，我们也投了这样的公司，呃，是做一些身份的认证啊，这些方面都会对将来的发展都会有很大的这个影响力的啊，我们会关注在这个领域，嗯。So one observation I've had, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is that I've kind of looked, if you say 10 years ago versus today, the investment interest in China and what China was interested in investing in and what the US was, was fairly different. And more and more it's converging. Right now, I'm, like when you talk about AI, you know, that, that's obviously big here, just like it is in China, um, big data, uh, blockchain, all very big hot topics in both areas. So uh, let me ask you this, are, are you seeing, um, or do you agree with that, that there's really a convergence of interest um, between what's hot here, what's hot there, um, and do you think it'll continue, or do you think it just, it's coincidental? Uh, this, I 但是这个呃，目前像在人工智能跟区块方面啊，目前还是在是一个呃技术上探讨啊，呃，在人工智能方面，目前特别是区块链方面，嗯，在实际的应用，在商业化实际上还有一段路要走啊，特别是区块链项目，呃，它怎么去找到一个商业化的应用，这肯定还是要需要一段一段路程来走，呃，但是在人工智能方面可能会更快一点商业化。呃，特别是在中国啊，呃，中国政府在这方面嗯、呃、做了很大的这个支持，呃，在中国有专门的人工智能专业基金，呃，有专门的这个人工智能的孵化器啊，呃，中国政府也在这方面给予很多的支持，呃，在应用方面呃也是有很大的发展的空间啊，啊、呃。Yeah, please. I, oh, go ahead. Well, I'll just comment as well. I mean. I did venture in the U.S. Uh, and also in China, and I do think that there's there's more of a commonality in, but the, the major difference is how the technologies are applied to different uh, to different markets. So you know, AI is a is sort of a you know you could think of it as computing tool, computing platform that can be applied across many markets for many reasons. Um, in the U.S., about half of our VCs focus. Uh, or around half of their funds focused on enterprise technologies. Uh, there's a little bit less uh, investment activity in, in enterprise technologies uh, in China for various reasons. Um, but I think there is, there is a sense of, of more, of greater sharing of technology and greater sharing of markets. So, so yeah, over time, more and more commonality. Uh, interesting, I, I, was, I was thinking when Mark, you asked the question, because actually my background before Blue Focus was majorly engaging all high-tech industry. When I started my career about, not reveal the true age, but several years ago, maybe a decade ago, uh, Cisco competed with Huawei. And at the time, you know, uh, people really call Huawei a copycat. Right, copycat in the way they even copy the manuals of Cisco's uh, handbook. However, if you look at today's world, if you look at AI, if you look at blockchain, uh, I myself travel more than 10 times every year between China and uh, US and also including Europe. You really see actually the two countries are coming hand to head. head, to head. Uh, they're not competing, they're also collaborating. And I think for the IP, they're sharing. But like uh, you know, my fellow speaker just mentioned, what China has is a, is a big, beautiful consumer base. And they also have much higher tolerance for error testing. That's the reason when we're talking about innovation, I still believe, maybe, maybe I'm biased, I still believe lots of the technology, true innovation still sits in Silicon Valley. Also, somewhere in China, for example, Beijing, around Shenzhen area. However, if you're talking about the business level, the engagement level, uh, innovation, lots of them actually coming from China because we have the you know very bold entrepreneurs there. You know have a 
big consumer base, they're willing to try a lot of things. So in some way, as a Chinese, I'm pretty confident uh, at AI, I'm, blockchain is still a little bit early to talk about, especially co talking about the commercialized use. But for AI, I think you know, China has a chance to surpass UA US. However, saying that is not encourage any more trade war or, or, or hostile talks between the two governments. I just want to say globalization is something you cannot stop and going backwards, no matter how politicians think about it. Thank you. All right. uh, Jessica. Uh, the U.S. is obviously experiencing a tax overhaul. Um, what are some of the key provisions that are aimed to stimulate tech innovation and foreign direct investment? Sure. Um, the IRS is really, at this point in time, 21% stakeholder of your company, right? Because everything you make, the U.S. Uh, top line rate is reduced, but still they take 21% of everything you ever made. So it's very, very important to understand the fiscal policies surrounding taxation. And uh, as you um, correctly labeled it, the U.S. has an overhaul of the whole regime, which means this is a new world now. Everything that we use to understand is no longer directly relevant. So there are several key provisions I think any CEO entrepreneurs absolutely need to keep in mind when this is the tax stuff. For example, um, the U.S. laws now really have uh, lots of provisions to um, attack the so-called stateless income, which means the U.S. government gets to tax you if you are uh, using the original structures of Cayman Island, BVI, and all these uh, tropical arrangements. <laughs> uh, that's one area that the U.S. law is being more complete. The other is U.S. is finally uh, enforcing its withholding tax regimes. So if you're running a U.S. startup with foreign partnerships, your venture cap is relying on foreign partnerships, and uh, you know, basically, you, your taxation cost just increased because U.S. IRS gets to tax on any kind of dividend and other kind of uh, earn, partnership earnings. So that's also an important thing. But there are a lot of incentives to encourage innovation. For example, you have a unlimited uh, time to use laws. It, it used to be it, within three to five years, your loss expired. So your entrepreneurial loss now, it could be used forever, but they put a very slow schedule as to how you can use it. Um, and also, uh, if you're investing in R&D, if, if not manufacturing, you will have to buy equipment. So there's a lot of bonus encouragement on immediate expensing. Basically, if you prop down fixed assets in the United States, you're gonna get a lot of advantages. You also had mentioned some changes in, in uh, the Chinese side tax law. Is that is that part of the yeah, yeah. yeah part of the mix is something that entrepreneurs should be thinking about as well in the cross border? Sector? Yeah, absolutely. I think in the uh, very many different sectors, U.S. and China are busy collaborating, but in technology, I think it's full on competition. <laughs> um, so from that perspective, um, I don't want to say China responded to it, but China did have quite a bit of tax policy changes and incentives that is very much focusing on having the intellectual property rights owned in China. And also China had uh, given out uh, some I want to say temporary, you know, in the next few years, you do have the window of opportunities to enjoy long-term laws, to enjoy um, basically super deductions on R&D activities happening anywhere in the world. If you use US engineers and set up your R&D shops here, you can actually take Chinese tax deduction. So that's like the first in the world to have uh, offer that kind of incentive. And China reduced uh, the value-added uh, tax percentage, which encourages import, you know, substantively. All right, thank you. Um, Eric, as a fund of funds investing in a good number of the leading venture capital firms in the Bay Area, uh, what are you seeing as developments in the venture capital community and uh, kind of what kind of returns are you expecting as these venture capital funds are, you know, in investing obviously in, in deploying increasingly large amounts of capital? Uh, That's a big question. Um, okay, so a couple of, couple of parts. Um, so generally we invest in funds that, uh, whose, whose major goal is to have a portfolio of 30 or 40 companies and within that portfolio, usually it's one or two or three that are very successful and drive the majority of the returns. 
So a fund that, that comes out you know, not performing well, it's generally, generally because they don't have that one big winner. Um, funds that come out to return you know, four, five, six times capital and more, it's usually because they're in, uh, they were involved in, in a couple of these massive, uh, massive winners. So, so VCs, they're not interested in a company even where they can get two or three times their money uh, you know, almost on a guaranteed basis. They're really looking for that company that can change, you know, reform an entire industry. Um, and that includes both early stage uh, and all the way through through later. As you get into late stage and growth, there's a little bit more of a tempering of, hey, if I'm going to invest in a company with $100 million sales and 50 to 100% top line growth, you know, then chances are pretty high that that there'll be a good outcome there, and I can afford to pay a higher valuation for that one. Um, see, so in terms of just general trends, I mean. That, you know, we've seen over really 50 years a continual consolidation towards the the leader, the leading firms. Um, we're we're in a very unique uh, industry, and you could from a from an asset management perspective, you'd say a, a strange asset class because the leaders tend to tend to you know accrue all of the uh, most of the bounty. And that happens over and over, and it's because an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, you seek out um, a firm that you think is going to help you, help your brand, help your, uh, help you recruit, help get more customers, um, and and right or wrong, there's sort of a perception that certain funds can do that more than others. So th those firms tend to see more of the, uh, more of those interesting, you know, the, the sort of hotter deals, and tend to have, uh, tend to have more winners. Um, but we also have seen quite a few firms that have been able to, in two or three funds, uh, come up and, and join the ranks of those uh, the sort of better known groups. So we're, as, a, as a fund manager, we're always looking for those next up and, up and coming uh, VC groups. Um, so about the diversification of a portfolio and how? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it varies a little bit between early stage and later stage. Um, with later stage, if you can consistently get sort of 15 to 20 percent net return, net IRR to your investors, uh, and something like two, more than 2x fund or 3x total fund, that's great performance. Uh, there are a few funds out there that in the growth world that have, have consistently returned better than 20 percent, um, and that's extraordinary performance. In the early stage funds, you're always going to have uh, high volatility, you know, you'll have a fund that has you know, an Uber and will have, you know, will be a 50% IRR or a, you know, 6x or 7x cash on cash return. And then the next fund may be an average fund because, as I said earlier, it's, it's kind of a hits driven business. And in, in those situations, we look more for the strategies uh, and the motivations of the individuals and the individual track records and their, their ability to add value to the, uh, to the portfolio companies. Well, Trenong, Trenong, maybe I could ask you a question. Is, is that a similar kind of way of investing that Chinese venture capital is approaching the market in that they're looking for kind of big hits, um, you know, kind of for early stage investments? Uh,我们在,呃,刚才说到,就说我们中国风投在早期阶段和后期阶段的投资策略是不一样的啊。呃,我们从,可能从天使人到A轮,我们都会看这个,这个区间里面都在看。呃,在早期投资我们会更多的
啊，团队是很重要啊，就是我们需要这个团队的这个呃创业创业团队的领导人。我们需要他具备我们叫三个能力啊，我们叫三力，三个力。第一个是他的这种领导能力啊，创业人必须有很强的领导能力。第二个是呃，我们需要他需要一定的呃学习能力，因为在一个新的公司创立当中，他的方向可能会有一些经常的一些调整啊，所以需要很强的学习能力。第三呢，我觉得嗯、呃，这个创业团队需要很强的执行能力啊。定完一个目标以后，有很强能力去实现它啊，这是对早期的这个项目。但是如果对这个后期的这个项目投资，我们可能可能会更关注一些它的财务数据啊，因为这个后期的这个这个呃企业可能已经比较成熟了，我会过多的从财务指标来去看这个公司，可能是呃考虑的方法是不一样的。OK， Holly， 呃、uh, ，kind of back to you。Uh, what kind of potential role would a major communications group be likely to take in facilitating cross-border business for startups? Uh, actually, I'm just looking at the audience. Is it most people speak Chinese rather than English? How many people native are English? How many native are Chinese? Mm. It's okay. <laughs> I, I was thinking to switch the language, but I, I guess I'll just stick to, China, uh, to English then. Um, the big communication group role actually, to be very honest, is being challenged. If you guys are familiar with the industry, I know this is Silicon Valley, if we have this forum differently, for example, in London or in Paris or, for example, in New York, we'll have different audience than people familiar with the group named like WPP, which is the biggest communication group in the world. Dentsu is the biggest uh, in Japan, and there's Omnicom, there's a publicist in France. So we're about the number seven in the world. Sounds magnificent. Actually, not at all. This, is, this industry is being challenged by several fronts. Number one comes from the consulting company. So consulting company, for example, like the guys you're familiar with, Accenture, Deloitte, and they are forming an arm called, for example, Accenture Interactive or Deloitte Digital. Because they realize when you have a strategy, you have to monetize it. How you're going to monetize, there are only several ways, right? So there's the way being going through the uh, technology, the IT infrastructure, that's what Accenture is good at. There's the, uh, you know, the, the financial side, like you, know, you guys are working for big you know, um, uh, accounting firms, KPMG doing that, things. And there's a third way, basically, that's marketing. Marketing is a way that can help you really monetize the, uh, the strategy. So for the big consulting company, they're coming from their side, actually going from the CEO, CEO level down towards the marketing channel to, to attack this field. So that's one challenge. Second challenge actually coming from some of the names our audience are familiar with, the technology company, for example, like Oracle, like, a, you know, uh, like a Salesforce, uh, like Adobe. They normally have a particular division called marketing uh, cloud division. They develop automated platform, basically, to replace what human beings doing, basically, by the, by the automated platform, even using AI. We actually also incubating several AI companies within Blue Focus, for example, to help writing the, uh, the press release using a machine. To, distribution, to distributing certain articles to Chinese, we, we call it the Zimei right? Like, you know, those um, uh, self-media platform through the machine. So there are a lot of things actually machine or trade um, or software can help you to achieve. So that's the second challenge. And also we see the, the big brand names and the, and the media actually are squeezing uh, the, the, the agency in between. For example, we know BAT in China, we know Google, Facebook, Snapchat here, they had more and more negotiation power. And the brand name side, they actually called uh, something in implemented called zero-based budgeting. So uh, for some people who are not familiar with zero-based budget, maybe Eric knows what that is. It came from actually the military background. When the, uh, the military said, that you know what, we go, when we're going to do the budgeting, we're not going to increase the budget only from what we spent from last year. So for example, okay, we spent, for example, $100 last year, and then the GDP growth is 2%, so let's spend one to $2, not anymore. Everything has to go back to zero and had to be justified. So this methodology is being implemented to all the big brand names in, in, in the business now. So you can tell, actually, for the so-called very brilliant marketing communication group, our business has squeezed around the whole ecosystem from different players. So how are we going to survive in this environment? Uh, very importantly, as I mentioned earlier, 
focus more on the data, on the performance, on the real performance, rather than purely telling a story. In the way, for example, we formed the e-commerce group, Blue Focus e-commerce within Blue Focus, because we're coming from, okay, instead of purely implementing a marketing program for you, how about we really sell the products for you? And we're not going to charge a retainer fee anymore, we're going to charge from the commission. If our marketing program helps you to really sell product, we're going to get a sales commission from it. So that's one way. And the other way, we also started from the, the big data uh, productize all the services. And the third thing, if we have some entrepreneurs sitting here uh, working on the startups, we also, I mean, I was talking, some of my team members are down there. We're also talking to the teams, can we modulize the service? So for example, Blue Focus came from serving huge clients in the world, you know, like the name I mentioned before, we, have, we used to have 200, 300 people sitting on one client. But for startup, maybe you cannot afford it. So maybe we can modulize services, for example, if you want to do PR, if you want to do event, if you want to do social, we make a menu for you. And then you just pick up the menu and then we can make the, 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 the choose much easier. So by multiple ways, I think we're dealing with the challenge coming from our field as well as you know, the challenge from uh, the, the, the external players. It's a very dynamic field. So you're really talking about sort of the uh, quantification of, of the marketing function, right? That's now that so marketing product projects now are based much more on an ROI uh, basis than on an individual ROI basis. Is that, is that because now of, you know, companies like Salesforce and others have, I mean, this is, the processes are all digitized, so now there's much more better measurement techniques of the success of a marketing campaign. I mean, I'm wondering sort of what's the driver of this change, or maybe it's just pressure on the, the CMO to, to perform and, sh and, and create that direct uh, correlation with bottom line. I wouldn't, see, I wouldn't say the, uh, the, the technology company, for example, like a Salesforce, Oracle, other one proactively drive it. I think adopt, they actually adopt it to the trend because they see that's a real need. For example, even for me, when I was sitting on the different side of the table running both sales and marketing for actually a public company, a Silicon Valley based uh, semiconductor company, I will ask my marketing team, why should I do this program? Why, why, why I want to distribute 30 press releases? Tell me what's the ROI, right? So, so the most efficient way is help people to sell. However, some result cannot very simply or purely measured by selling per se. So there's other ways, for example, we call the click-through rate, right? There's a, you know, impression per thousand people, things like that. There are different things that can help you at least to measure that, yeah. Well, nowadays you even have ways to measure reputation. You know, you have uh, like online reputation, the, the ability to quantify what that means too. So things that used to be sort of softer and unmeasurable um, now are, are becoming part of somebody's KPIs. Is that right? That's right. I don't mean to occupy the whole conversation, but basically um, there's soft uh, measurement and there's really hard measurement, right? Well, we used to have some index, for example, to uh, measure the uh, intangible value of a brand, right? So we ha also have, for example, like a Nielsen index to measure the, the viewability of certain programs. That's still there. And that's the reason we see, for example, at the uh, Super Bowl, like maybe many of you guys watch Super Bowl, uh, you know, easily a 30 seconds um, advertising still can cost five million dollars. Five million dollars only for 30 seconds. So those kind of things, how are you going to measure that? That's coming from the intangible way. And then the tangible way coming from the real performance, we call the performance marketing, which is real performance driven. That's really, I think for a lot of things actually for service oriented, even for merge acquisition, we talk about merge acquisition, we talk about taxation, we talk about lots of cross-border services. It, has to be measured by the, the real result. I think with more and more digitized journey in place, this is the only way you can go. By saying that, I'm not de-emphasize the human side, the emotional side of the story. You know, that's how the creative come into the picture. But, you, but in today's world, you have to find a way to combine the creativity better with the product, service, and technology coming together. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chen Long, uh, ask you a question. If, if I'm a startup, um, what, when should I be looking to U.S. venture capital and when should I be looking to Chinese venture capital? Um, kind of what are, what are the key differences and uh, when would I be better off going to one class of venture capital versus another? 
呃，我觉得这个可能从你其实在两个方面哈，是中国的这个初创公司怎么去找美国的这个投资，另外一个问题是这个呃呃海外的这个呃公司找中国的市场啊。呃，这两方面我觉得都是有机会啊，但是要看你的呃呃目的是什么。作为一个中国的一个初创公司，呃呃，我觉我觉得这个先到美国来，如果要资金的话，你可能更多的不是需要他的钱，你可能更多需要是他的他的这种渠道啊。比如说，中国很多的企呃更多的公司啊，在美国。做一些投资或者收购一些企业，他更多考虑的是建立一个研发中心啊，做一个渠道。所以我觉得，呃，目前来说，中国的初创公司，嗯，到美国来找钱，这个可能会在中国谋资会更容易一点啊，因为大家都知道，在呃，从一九呃二零一六年开始啊，很多的硅谷这边是预料到我们叫做资本的寒冬啊，很多的资呃这个。本地的很多企业都募不了资，所以对中国的创公到美国募资是一个比较困难的事情。相反过来啊，在中国，在二零一六年的时候，嗯，这个资本市场非常的这个火热，啊，那个时候在中国大家都知道在做叫一个叫双创啊，啊，资金非常的充裕啊，呃，在同时实际上很多的呃美国硅谷的公司会跑到中国来来投资啊。啊，包括我们公司也在投了很多硅谷的公司，投过一些欧美的公司啊，所以我觉得就要看你的目的在哪，呃，是目的是什么啊？第二就是从美美国这样的公司，呃，更多的来说，我觉得，嗯、呃，如果它是一个有很强的技术，啊啊，我觉得还是很会在中国呃获得投资啊，因为大家都知道这个呃，目前在同样一个初创公司在估值方面这个。中国的估值普遍会比美国的公司估值要高，啊，这也是为什么我们嗯、呃、在和汉海集团在美国我们成立一个海鹰基金，目的就是说啊、呃，我们希望把一些美国的一些比较好的技术创新的公司，希望他们的技术能够在这里做一些研发啊，把这些技术带到中国去啊，所以我觉得目前这个阶段来说，可能对。呃，美国的这些巨型公司到中国去呃投资去募资是非常好的。第二个呢是在中国的政府呃目前也是有很多的这种呃优惠政策啊，包括中国政府搞出很多像呃千人计划啊，尤其对一些中国的留学生啊，像北京是有这个海剧计划啊，像深圳政府搞的孔雀计划啊，嗯、呃、这些不光是呃这些投资是是一些一些。政府的支持啊，所以我觉得加上这个民营的这种资本，加上政府的支持，对一些呃美国的创公司在中国的募资会有很大的发展的空间啊，这可能是会更更好一点啊，这是我个人的建议。One very practical recommendation, though, uh, for a U.S. startup, when you go to Chinese try to China try to raise the money, you need to think about how you're going to move the money outside China. There's still monetary policy actually doesn't allow you to really to do that. So unless you've had a way to use the money in China to develop the team, develop technology, it probably is not that practical at the moment. Well, Jessica, I mean, this goes into your question quite well. So if you're a startup here, um, considering the changes and the tax policies of U.S. and China, what are some strategies and uh, kind of uh, thoughts you've got that uh, startups here can think about? Yeah, I think there's one key message, key message, <laughs> which is get your intellectual property ownership structure set up right as early as possible. The U.S. China laws all have ways to catch stateless income and uh, basically become your default 21 or 25 percent shareholder of everything you do. So have your IP structure set up early and uh, don't count on in the future trying to uh, have remedial procedures to fix it. So set it up right up front. And I think we've got time for one more question. So, Eric, uh, again, probably a good number of startups um, here in the audience. Just based off of your you know, kind of decades of experience with VCs, 
Um, what have you seen as a common thread between those that succeed ultimately in getting funded, being successful companies, and uh, those that don't, or any other advice you've heard in terms of uh, cross-border um, that we've discussed today opened up for you to, to, to uh, discuss those? Um, all right, couple couple points. I, I did I did VC for much longer than I did fund of funds, so um, in a sense we we use the same criteria to uh, from from the, our venture capital investment experience to to pick the funds that we work with, and I think the cross border topic is such an interesting one. I mean I I invested in China for a while and I invested in the United States for a long time, and the cross border opportunity is enormous. Uh, I do think it's, uh, you know, the biggest piece of advice I would give to most early stage startups is really consider whether it makes sense for you to devote resources at the early stages to try to go overseas. And in particular, you know, China's a difficult market. You've probably gotten a lot of advice for how to go about entering the Chinese market. Um, raising capital in, in China is often a good idea uh, for certain specific reasons. but. Really look at your strategy and say, you know, um, how much how much resources can we really afford to spend to enter a Chinese market? You know, Series A and Series B investors nowadays in the U.S. will almost always say, focus, 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 focus your business strategy. You know, get your customer set down, um, and you know, startup founders if they can drive down to San Jose to see a customer. It's much easier and saves much more time versus flying to, to China to do so. So um, I often hear about, yesterday I, I gave a talk about uh, in, an incubation forum. And incubation, uh, incubators often do a lot of cross-border work. In some, some cases, it's the perfect match for the business plan, especially you know, hardware companies need to have great re um, relationships in China. And certain types of businesses make sense for cross-border to take advantage of resources on, uh, that may exist on each side. Um, but by and large, your VCs are going to tell you later, you know, just focus, just uh, you know, focus on your core market. Um, I'd say, you know, the, the, the question about what are the kinds of, of, uh, of companies that are, are successful and that get backed is an ever-changing one and, and you know, people always sort of say there's two, two components. Is it more important, do you back the entrepreneur or do you back the business opportunity? And if you ask 10 VCs that question, it'll be about five and five and they'll each have a slightly different take on their answer. Um, of course, you have to have both, um, but the, you know, we, we generally believe that if you kind of look across the portfolios that are successful, it's more often the founder that made, that made it happen. And the founder can be, if you look at businesses like, um, um, you know, in the early days, uh, Uber, Uber had a very different business model and the founder was very smart about how, how to navigate uh, and, and change the business model to, to hit the core of the market. So a great founder can save a, a bad business, but the reverse is not true. So um, more, more often, the, the, the entrepreneur will be the one that we, that we tend to bet on. Well, thank you very much.